everybody, Pat Armstrong here with the latest edition of Increase, the lifestyle vlog for men and the women who love them. I hope everyone is staying well during this time of isolation and social distancing, but this is the perfect opportunity to focus on building yourself mentally, physically, spiritually, and socially, so you'll be ready to face the world when all these bands are finally lifted. Let me ask you a question. Who would come to mind if I were to ask you to name a historic king of Israel? Now, for those who have some Bible knowledge, you may name someone like Josiah, who began to reign as an eight-year-old boy. Someone else might name Hezekiah, who was struck down by a deadly disease, but prayed to God and was healed. Now, I know many would definitely mention Solomon for his wisdom, but I believe that the majority of people would probably say David. You know, David by far is the most popular king Israel ever had. But I believe if you were to say to the average person, tell me something about King David, most would answer Bathsheba. Now, David's popularity began as a teenage boy when he defeated the giant Goliath. His popularity continued to grow as a general in Saul's army who won many victories for Israel. And of course, the people loved the idea when David became their king. Now, personally, I have been reading in 2 Samuel, and we're going to pick up the story in chapter 11. And at this point, David has now been king for about eh, 10 years or so. And everything is going well for Israel. In fact, Israel has flourished under his leadership. And David has gotten comfortable and maybe a little bit too comfortable. The Bible tells us it's the spring of the year and it was customary for the kings to lead their armies into battle during this time of year. But David, for whatever reason, sent his army out and he stayed home. Now, whether he didn't feel well, whether he had total confidence in his generals and didn't feel the need to go, or whether he just didn't want to, we don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us. But this decision, whether it was right or wrong, and for whatever the reason, led to the lowest point of David's life. Now, the Bible tells us one spring evening, David was having insomnia, and so he decided to take a stroll around the palace. As he walked out onto one of the balconies to assess his kingdom, he caught a glimpse of a woman taking a bath. The Bible says she was, very, she was a very beautiful woman, and unfortunately for both of them, David's glimpse turned into a gawk, which became a gaze. And so he inquired of the woman, and even though he knew who she was and that she was married to one of the soldiers in his army, David sent for her, and then, of course, the rest is history. Now, if that isn't bad enough, a few weeks go by, and David receives a message from Bathsheba informing him that she is pregnant with his child. Now, David begins to panic, and he comes up with a plan and sends to the battlefield for Bathsheba's husband, Uriah. Uriah arrives at the palace, and of course, the king wants a full report of what's going on with the battle, and so Uriah gives him all the information and delivers the report, and then David tells him, you know what, Uriah, I want you to go home and enjoy your leave for a few days before going back into battle. But Uriah, rather than going home, he stays overnight with the servants because he feels bad to go home and enjoy the luxuries of home while his fellow Israelites are out in the battlefield. So now David thinks all is well. No one will ever know what happened because Uriah has gone home and will surely enjoy some time with his wife. And then she will later reveal she is pregnant and Uriah will think it's his. But the problem 
which David found out later, is Uriah still didn't go home. In fact, Uriah was still at the palace. So David calls for him again. And this time, David gets Uriah drunk and tries again to send him home. But Uriah, even in his drunken stage, will not go home. So finally, out of desperation, David sends Uriah back to the battlefield, carrying the very orders for his own death. And when David receives the message that Uriah has died, being the upstanding man that he is, he gives Bathsheba time to mourn the death of her husband, and then he marries her. Now, I'm not here to bash David, and, and Lord knows I've done plenty of wrong things in my life. But at the same time, I'm not excusing David either. He did some horrible things, committing adultery, trying to hide it by getting Uriah drunk, and then ultimately having him killed. And it's, it's just too bad. This is how many people remember King David. But today, I want to look at five things that all of us can learn from David to help us in our daily walk through life. Number one, be careful. Now, I know this is very basic and really goes without saying, but I believe a lot of times we either get comfortable or we get complacent and throw caution to the wind. And we've always got to be on guard. Now, that doesn't mean we are going to be perfect. The Bible even tells us in 1 John 1, 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. But at the same time, that is not an excuse for us to live and act recklessly. Number two, make it right. When we do what is wrong, and it will happen, we need to go to everyone involved and ask forgiveness. Now, some will forgive and others will not, but you've done what you're supposed to do. And that's exactly what David did when confronted with these things. He immediately made it right, first of all, with God, and then with everyone involved. On the other hand, there is no need to announce it to the world or talk to people who are not involved. I mean, frankly, it's none of their business. Now, I'm not talking about counseling. Counseling can be helpful. What I'm talking about is gossiping, and gossiping never helps. Number three, Accept the consequences. There are always consequences for everything we do, whether it be good, whether it be bad. David had some major consequences that paralleled exactly what he did. As a result of the adultery, his wives were later scandalously shamed in public. As a result of the murder of Uriah, David's household was always in turmoil, and many of his children were either shamed or killed by their own siblings. And, in fact, the child that was born to Bathsheba died. There are always consequences, and the acts that we commit, whether we think so or not, will affect other people. Number four, don't dwell in the past. Now, if you've done the first three things, you need to let it go. Whether you're the one who committed the offense or the one to whom the offense was committed. Now, is it that easy? Uh, no, but we've got to let it go. If you don't, it will continue to fester and eat at you like a cancer, making you more bitter at whomever is involved, or even bitter at yourself. Do you know that bitterness is the only acid that destroys its own container? 
And finally, number five, look to the future. Now, I want to make myself perfectly clear here. There is no excuse for doing what is wrong, but it is a wonderful thing to know that when it does occur, there is always forgiveness from God. 1 John 1, 9 reminds us, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Do you know that most of David's great accomplishments occurred after this time in his life? He made Israel the greatest nation in the world during this time and prepared the way for his son Solomon to build an even greater nation. David also came up with the plans and everything that was needed to build the temple of God that his son Solomon completed. But the most important thing of all is that it was through the union of David and Bathsheba and their son Solomon that Jesus Christ was ultimately born. So yeah, we're all guilty. We've all done something wrong. In fact, the Bible even tells us in Romans chapter 3 and verse 10, there is none righteous, no, not one. So here's a couple of final thoughts. To the offender, learn from your mistakes. Make it right and then forget about it. Live with the consequences, but don't allow the consequences to determine your future. You and your potential must determine your future. To the offended, forgive and forget. Now again, I know it's easier said than done, but it's not going to accomplish anything to hang it over the head of someone else. Hopefully you can work it out. But if not, and it means you separate yourself from that person, you might have to. But for your own sake, let it go. Don't allow their mistakes to determine your future. You and your potential must determine your future. And finally, to those who are not involved, pray. And if you're not going to pray, shut up.